No, great. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Okay, so we're going to continue where we left off the other day with the Enterobacteria ACE. Um, I'm doing this for my memory stick because I saw a couple of pictures uh, from Dennis Kunkel's website the other day that I liked. It doesn't add anything you've got to you know, learn um, anything more expected of you. It just makes, I think they're just nice pictures. They just make things a little clearer. So anyway, uh, the, the, we, there'll be a couple of extra slides in here that, if you're looking on the net, we do a different, different, different version. Um, and I think the other day, uh, Dr. Mayer pointed out to me that I, I think I misspoke. Um, um, we're going to start with Salmonella typhi here, which is, and Salmonella typhi is a plague, They're one of the major plagues, but it's not the plague. It's Salmonella typhi causes typhoid, and it's one of the classical causes of uh, the plagues that wiped out, you know, went on with the Black Death, which is uh, Yersinia pestis, um, and, and that is plague, that wiped out good chunks of Europe a few hundred years ago. And I actually learned something myself this morning, because I was going to talk about Typhoid Mary, which I was assumed was, was English, who was always assumed was English, and I found out it was actually a famous American that, uh, that, was, that was around 1907. So we'll use her as an example of what happens in typhoid in a little bit. Okay, so we've discussed so far, uh, we, we have discussed the Enterobacteriaceae, including the, all the different genera that can cause opportunistic infections. We have discussed some of the specific members of the Enterobacteriaceae that occasionally do things in the, in the, uh, um, the population, such as Klebsiella, Proteus, we've discussed. We, continue, we, we then got on to the Shigella, where we said that there were four different species that caused the one disease, Shigellosis. We're now getting, we now started, and we started on the Salmonella, where we, where we said that there are, in fact, um, several thousand different serotypes, but they're really broken down into three different groups that correlate with the three diseases that they cause. The Salmonella, you've now getting into, I don't know if we should have really defined this term earlier, but the word zoonotic um, is an important term that relates to whether something is transmitted from an animal, either directly or indirectly, or whether it comes from a, a human reservoir. And these are quite different, these three different salmonella diseases. Salmonellosis that we discussed comes from the animal um, food, from, I mean from meat and eggs and what have you. It's, it's coming from eating contaminated um, food from animals. So it's really a, a zoonotic infection in a sense. But um, in, in cholery Swiss, so, sorry, sorry, cholery Suis is, is, an, is an example of, uh, that's not usually referred to as salmonellosis, and that's what we discussed because it is a little bit different in terms of the fact that you can get it, occasionally get it into the bloodstream, which you do not see in the vast bulk of cases of salmonellosis. And we generally think of salmonellosis as a rather mild thing that just uh, goes away on its own. But when you get to typhoid, you don't think about it that way. Typhoid is one of the classic plagues that, have, you know, that were worthy, you know, wiped out good chunks of mankind you know, a few hundred years ago, and are still major diseases in, in uh, the underdeveloped world. Um, in fact, those of you who listened to CNN this weekend, we've, we've heard of that typhoid came up as possibly killing bin, bin Laden. I mean, that's wild speculation, but the only reason I bring it up is it, is it makes the point that it's, um, you know, that it's still with us. It's not a disease that's gone away, not by a long stretch of the imagination. Now, in this country, it's, you don't see, really don't see typhoid, but you certainly can see it in the underdeveloped world. And I was pleased to see that not only did I make a mistake when I referred to typhoid, <laughs> I also, you know, Dr. May is laughing, um, the CNN correspondent, Dr. Ravit, Rajiv Gupta, I think his name is, went on to refer to the clinical symptoms where that there was a paralysis below the waist and said that it couldn't possibly have been caused by the polio, it was called by typhoid, which is not the feature of it, went on to say it was caused by the polio bacterium. And he said that several times. So I thought, well, I'm not, and you know, polio is a virus, of course. So anyway, we all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But anyway, that's ty typhoid is still with us in the third world. Whether it caused Ben Laden's death or not, I personally don't know and don't really think it's relevant to this lecture, but it certainly shows you that it's still a disease that has not gone away, not by a long shot. All right, typhoid is sometimes referred to as enteric fever. It is the severest salmonella disease, and that's, that's the understatement of the year. I mean, you don't usually die from salmonellosis. You might not need many cases even go to a physician, because it's a bit, and you don't even know you've had it. It's only the severe case you have, but somebody gets typhoid, uh, you know, a good chunk of the people, if untreated, will die. Simple as that. So it's a, and, it, and the reason it's so severe, we'll show you in a second, what, uh, we'll get to a later slide what the problem is. 
So salmonella typhi is the cause of typhoid, one of the classic plagues, okay, but not the plague, <laughs> as I wrongly stated earlier. The, the, one of the classic plagues, the uh, typhoid. And epidemics are still common in the third world, and again, as I mentioned, we don't see it much in Europe. And the reason we don't see typhoid much is because like all the other things I've been talking, not all the other things, but most of the things I've been talking about relate to uh, contamination with sewage or manure or what have you, depending on um, situation. But it's usually um, where there's a problem with the uh, water or food supply being contaminated. And that's why we don't see this in America or, or Europe very little because we have very good um, systems to make sure the stuff doesn't contaminate the water and food supply. Okay, so unlike salmonellosis and unlike the disease caused by salmonella um, cholerae suis, uh, salmonella the, the reservoir is the human being. And the fact that there's a carrier state is really the, you know, one of the major issues in the disease. Because what happens is many people who get typhoid will die. But some are, for whatever reason, are just totally unaffected or very, or very you know, mild or no disease. And, uh, or it just goes unnoticed. And you'll see, I'll give you the life cycle in I think, the next slide or so. And the issue is, is that because of this, the, the, this, this organism can reside for quite a long time in the gastrointestinal tract, it's, sh it's shed. And if somebody is a food handler, and they don't wash their hands properly, you know, if they've been to the bathroom, um, being food handlers, they can affect, or cooks, they can affect people. And that's in fact what originally happened apparently with Typhoid Mary. She was, a, she was a cook working for a family and they initially caught it that way and about 30 people or so died. It wasn't a huge epidemic that wiped out America or anything, but it was a, you know, a small epidemic and an example of the sorts of things that can happen. The epidemics, of course, in Europe were, were, were many hundreds of years ago were much larger by comparison. And it can be not just the food, but the water supply as well that gets contaminated. And again, it's poor sanitary conditions. The whole issue is here. Because we don't generally vaccinate. And I think when somebody asked me a question uh, the other day about vaccines, and you really should understand is that with vaccines, first of all, it's extremely expensive and time consuming to make vaccines. And secondly, not only is it expensive and time consuming, you've got to have a reason to use a vaccine. If you've got, you aren't going to vaccinate 200 million people because a handful of people are going to get a disease each year. Even if you had a decent vaccine, you wouldn't do it. Okay, so vaccines are used really in situations where they're going to do a lot of good. And there is a vaccine that it's mainly used by, not used very often, but used by travellers in particular who go to third world countries. And because just, just frankly, the, the way to control this disease is not by vaccination. It's a hell of a lot cheaper to clean up your act because the water system and washing your hands and what have you and having uh, infections as we do in this country. And why would you waste your time spending millions and millions of dollars on a vaccine? Now, other situations, vaccines are absolutely essential and they, because there's no other way to control it, the situation. Okay, so that's the situation. Now, th this is the life cycle, basically, of what happens in typhoid. In typhoid, what happens is the organism, in this instance, does not stay put in the intestinal, in the intestine lumen, intestinal lumen. It, does, it doesn't stay put in the epithelial layer either. It gets through and it gets into the bloodstream and this is this very poor presentation here is supposed to be a macrophage with these gram negative rods within it. And these, this, I believe these organisms are carried around in these macrophages and they, they, they get into the bloodstream and they can stay there for, a, you know, it says for quite a while. Now that's what's, going to, that's what's presumably going to cause the trouble and kill the person when it gets into the bloodstream. But what then happens is the organism then gets into the gallbladder and, and, and sort of colonises the gallbladder. And from there the organisms are shed for some sort of weeks and in the case of these major carriers it could even be a lot longer than weeks. It could be months or even years sometimes in the case of a very severe carrier. But certainly it will be shed for a, for a, typically for a few weeks. Well, the point is that person may well not be sick at that point. The organism is in the gallbladder. They've, 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 they've recovered. It's not in the bloodstream anymore. And they're still shedding. And if they keep the shed large amounts and they shed it for a long period of time, that carrier is going to perpetuate an infection. So this is a case of a human reservoir. Okay? And, it is not, and that is why we single this out. It's totally different in severity. And it's totally different in the way it, what happens as opposed to what happens in typical cases of salmonellosis that make up the vast, vast bulk 
So they're different questions. If you ask the question, what's more important, and I wouldn't put something in such a vague way. I certainly learned this morning, be very careful how I phrase questions. No, but seriously, um, if, you know, if, if it was important, it depends what you mean by important. In terms, of the, you know, in terms of the American population in this day and age, salmonellosis is much more important because there are lots of, it's one of the most common uh, zoonotic infections we have. And people get gastrointestinal infections. If you talk in terms of the third world or if you talk in terms of the past, you would have said typhoid was the, uh, was the much more important disease because it's the disease that kills. Okay? So we know the differences now, but, and the Salmonella cholerae Swiss is just, Swiss is just the odd few, ca few cases here and there, and we've singled it out because it's atypical in that the organism does occasionally spread into the bloodstream, which is not typical for salmonellosis. Okay, so the two extremes are typhoid and salmonellosis with the odd few cases of Salmonella Swiss just thrown in for good measure. Okay, you go. Is this going to continue a cycle inside of a person? I mean, is it going to reinfect well, the typical person, it, it wouldn't be, because that's, that's the whole thing with a carrier. A carrier is considered, to be, uh, in any, is considered to be the odd situation, the unique individual. So you would think most of the time it wouldn't. Okay, but, 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 those, but the carriers are the ones you have to worry about, because I don't think so much it's reinfecting, it's just, it's just not being eliminated, and it's just constantly shedding. So I don't, think, I don't think there's a lot of cases of reinfection. I think once the person's probably been cured, they're cured. But the carrier's the big deal. Okay? Well, in a, yeah. in a, is the carrier going to be experiencing all the symptoms? Well, that's the problem. The carrier may not. That's the whole thing. Because if the carrier had the symptoms, um, you, know, you, would, you, would, you would know that the person was sick. They would, you wouldn't have, even, even in India, you wouldn't have somebody who's got a nasty fever and is listless and sort of, you know, is just... Uh, you know, half dead, you wouldn't have them working in your, you know, in a, in a kitchen or something. But it's the problem is if the person doesn't have the symptoms and is still shedding, then you don't know they've got the disease and they're, and they're a threat. Okay? And apparently the case of this, I was just reading about it last night, the case of uh, this typhoid Mary, I mean, she actually was not, not exactly in prison, but she was actually put away somewhere so that she couldn't uh, keep on doing this for, you know, for, this wasn't just a period of a few weeks, it was years, you know, so... But anyway, I hope that's obviously the atypical situation. But okay, so the carrier may be asymptomatic, and you know, may, may, um, you know, we may not, see, we may not, we may not notice. And that's a general situation with carriers. You know, I mean, you just, you know, you, you just may not be aware there's something going on. You know, and uh, that's the problem. Uh, particularly the capsule, as Dr. Mayer emphasised again about capsules. This organism does have, I think, called the VI antigen, the virulence. Um, factor, uh, which is a capsule, which is believed to protect the organism. And I suppose I should point out, as we said here, oftentimes Salmonella typhi is carried around in macrophages. It's not considered an intracellular pathogen as such, because it's perfectly happy if it's not inside a macrophage. Um, but capsules can also help protect, not just when an organism is outside a cell, but they're presumably involved in actually, in some instances, actually protecting from helping the organism survive when it's been phagocytosed. Okay, so the difference it comes down to is you're talking about an extracellular, when an organism is extracellular versus when it's intracellular. And in this instance, I, I would assume it's doing both. But anyway, that's the issue. The major point I don't want to make so much about this, about this organ, I want to talk about capsules in general. Okay, if an organism is extracellular, the capsule is going to be involved in inhibiting phagocytosis. And in some cases, if the organism gets inside, being the fact that it's a polysaccharide capsule, and we don't have enzymes that can degrade with the weird polysaccharides that are often found in bacteria, there's no way to degrade that capsule and it can help protection in many cases. Okay, typhoid therapy, no different than anything we said in this whole previous lecture so far and we'll say for the rest of this lecture. In this case, antibiotics are essential because the organism, if it gets into the bloodstream, you know, that's, you know, that's a absolute requirement with a bacterial infection. If it's in the bloodstream, you treat. Not necessarily the case for a viral infection, because viral infections aren't always necessarily producing obvious, obvious symptoms. Um, the vaccines are not considered to be totally effective. If they were totally effective, then, then one, one can only hope that they would be using these and, and vaccinating widely in the third world. Um, but there are vaccines out there for typhoid Okay, so that's what we've said so far. Um, we've now dealt with 
the Enterobacter, ACE, Shigella, Salmonella, and now we're dealing with Yersinia. And again, Yersinia are singled out. They're still a member of the Enterobacteria ACE, but they're singled out here because they're additional things. These are not opportunists. opportunists the, regular, the, the typical opportunistic situation that I talked about at the beginning of the last lecture regarding uh, all these numerous different species and genera of Enterobacteriaceae that you can be infected with in the hospital. This is where, again, healthy people can be infected. Now, Yersiniosis was not so well known about in this country because when you think about this organism, it, it's particularly an organism that, that we mentioned in an earlier lecture about there's a few organisms can do okay in the cold. Most bacteria love to grow at 37 degrees centigrade and don't do very well if you put them in a refrigerator. Well, this particular organism does. And anything you can do to think about cold, that's associated with Yersiniosis. It was particularly first noted in Scandinavia. There have been large outbreaks of, um, of uh, Yersiniosis in Scandinavia. And indeed, that's one of, the, one of the major reasons that we know that Yersinia is a cause of Ryder's writer, syndrome that, you know, that Dr. Mayer brought up earlier because that's the, that there was these large epidemics there and we saw uh, people, you know, actually saw the association between HLA-B27 when it was discovered in the early 70s and basically this association with this, this is the first came about, uh, particularly because of the association with Yersinia. So Scandinavia, the cold, that's why you're particularly thinking about this organism. But we got smart eventually in the United States and we realised that, 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 that the fact that if they could grow in the cold in Scandinavia, maybe they could grow in the cold in this country as well. And so what happened was is that people changed the ways of doing things in the clinical lab, which we'll get to, I think, in probably the next slide, and noticed that it also occurs in this country. So um, it's transmitted, again, fecal contamination. We're all, all often thinking about fecal contamination and when we think about this group of organisms from domestic animals. It can be in water, milk or meat, any things that you care to think about. Um, I don't know what this actually comes from in this country. Certainly we don't have herds of reindeer floating around, but in Scandinavia that's what it would be. Um, okay, so in the gut lumen. Now this is a case again where this organism, I've shown it here, being in the epithelium. But the key point is this word down the bottom there. There is an occasional bacteremia that we see in your cineosis, which we, as I said, the vast, vast bulk cases of species, uh, of, uh, whatever you want to call them, serotypes or species of salmonella, depending on your predilection. Don't, you don't get the organism into the bloodstream ever. Uh, in this instance, this organ does occasionally get into the, into the bloodstream. So that's a little bit unique about the Yersinia. And I'm not talking, I'm purposely not covering pestis because um, historically we, people tend to discuss zoonotic infections as a group and then the last four years, it turns out that most of the organisms that we discussed as a group as being zoonotic are actually also potentially biological warfare agents. And so they're, all, they're now discussed for both reasons as a group later on. And Yersinia pestis is one of the major organisms that have been used by, or considered to be used by the military. Well, actually, I should rephrase that. In this country, we cannot, we're not allowed by treaty, but there's a Nobel Prize awarded to stop this. We're not allowed to carry out offensive um, attacks in the, or even offensive research in this country. But anyway, with the possibility of being considered, Yersinia pestis is on the top list of organisms that one would use, could use as a biological warfare agent. So I'm not discussing Yersinia pestis here. That's being discussed um, by Dr. Gaffar along the zoonotic diseases and among the, uh, the classically, uh, you know, the, um, as it's classically discussed with that diseases such as anthrax or brucellosis or um, these organisms of this type. I'm talking here about Yersinia entercolitica, which I think, which hopefully I put down somewhere, yeah, Enter Yersinia entercolitica, okay? We, and we're talking about that slightly different, but separately than uh, Yersinia pestis. And the other organism that we're mentioning just a little bit is Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, okay? So the pestis is quite different and don't, it is, Yersinia pestis is a Yersinia and it is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae and that you need to know regardless of where, where Dr. Gaffar covers it in the course. But it's, um, we, we, it's, a, it's a very different sort of disease. Um, the cold enrichment is what I'm talking about here and that's what was recognised. After a while somebody got smart and said, hey, you know, if it's growing up, showing up in places like Sweden and what have you, where it's free, and Finland where it's freezing cold, maybe these organisms are peculiar in the way they grow. And it was shown that simply you can put these organisms in a fridge and let it for a few days and uh, other organisms will die off and these organisms survive and even grow. 
And that's what the term cold enrichment means. Okay, so you're particularly thinking about cold when you think about Yersinia enterocolitica and Yersinia uh, pseudotuberculosis. And I'm not talking about Yersinia pestis. Okay. All right. Um, okay, I like these slides from... Uh, I don't make a big deal in this course about what these things look like, but I think the reason I put this up here is because... Can I get this thing down? Well, should be the stage off, I would have thought. I can't, it looks, doesn't look very good. Can you see it okay out there? Where I am, it doesn't look very clear, okay. Well, the issue is this. In this lecture, I mentioned we've been particularly discussing the Enterobacteriaceae, and you should know immediately that this couldn't be a member of the Enterobacteriaceae because you've seen pictures of Salmonella, Shigella, and what have you, and these things are curved rods. There's the occasional thing in that isn't curved, but generally they're curved. They're not spiral, they're curved. Their shirts are comma shaped. And so I'm not, gonna, I'm not asking you to memorize what this slide looks like. I just want to emphasize the fact these are not members of the Enterobacteriaceae. They're comma shaped organisms. And this is another organism, of, of one of the classic plagues, cholera. Gram negative rods, usually referred to as rods, but they're actually comma shaped. Okay? Like the Enterobacteriaceae, they're faculty of anaerobes, they grow very well. And this particular test is put in here because, unfortunately, every organism doesn't look exactly the same under the microscope. And you can see this particular culture has got a few rods in there. And if there happened to be an organ, a particular strain that maybe there was a few more rods and a few less comma-shaped organisms there, maybe you might confuse it and say, well, actually, that's an enteric. And remember the Enterobacteriaceae. So you do another test. This is the oxidase test which is basically involves um, one of the enzymes from the uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And it's a simple colour reaction, and you throw this stuff on a plate and see if the colour changes. If it's oxidase positive, it'll, it'll change colour. If it's oxidase negative, it won't. And that's how you can usually tell the difference between the Vibrios and the Enterobacteriaceae, and that's what it's particularly used for. And these organisms, just like the Enterobacteriaceae, have simple nutritional requirements, and they're readily grown. So you could confuse things. Now, hopefully you wouldn't because you'd be aware that somebody's got a disease clinically looks like cholera and you say, well, hang on a minute here, that, that's pretty obvious, that's cholera. Okay. Now, uh, again, we're talking about, when we talk about these um, epidemics, be they, even if they're small epidemics sometimes, we're talking about occurring in the third world in particular. And again, it's uncommon in the US for the same reasons that we've already given. Um, but again, travelers can get cholera. And it does occur in seafood because these organisms, um, they're quite, they do quite well in salt water. They don't die off in salt water like many organisms do. And so these organisms can infect seafood. So you do, and you see it in some places like, for example, it's more common in Japan than it would be in, uh, than in the United States for that reason. So the transmission of vibrio cholerae, again, this is a typical example of where the reservoir is human. Okay, so this, this is a big deal in this particular lecture. It won't be a big deal in some of the other lectures, but, but because of the contrast and the way the diseases occur, particularly relates to the source from it being animal or, anim or contaminated food or from uh, people. In this case, this human feces gets into the water and these organisms do quite well in fresh or salt water and it gets into the contaminates food. So you don't have to distinguish food and water. It can be both. And that's how you get cholera. Now, the, the, the hallmark of cholera is most pathogens, if they don't attach to something, then they're just going to be flushed out. So I'm not saying it's a requirement of any pathogen that it has to attach somewhere in the body, but it's pretty common. So attachment is an issue, but that doesn't mean you get sick because you, your, your guts are full, your intestines are full of bacteria which are attached to the, your epithelia, epithelia. Nothing happens, you're perfectly fine. So yes, attachment is important, but the hallmark of cholera is cholerogen, the actual toxin, the exotoxin produced. And I didn't, uh, I think, what, what's your name over there? Joy, maybe you'll get a little more of an answer than you did the other day, but not much of one. <laughs> okay. 
We talked about E. coli and heat label toxin. Okay, that was basically discovered many years after the cholera toxin. And the, the mechanism of cholera toxin was known for a long, long time. And so it was a lot easier when people discovered the heat label toxin of E. coli to relate it to um, the cholera. Because, he, because the uh, disease caused by enterotoxigenic E. coli, as I mentioned earlier, is very mild compared to cholera. But it is the same mechanism. And so we tend to emphasise the situation in cholera more than make the E. coli as the secondary thing because of the fact that this is the more potent toxin. It is the one where everything came from, our knowledge came from in the first place. And this is a typical, I used the term AB toxins earlier, and I won't use that term a lot in this course, uh, this but here's an example of an AB toxin. In this case, it binds to gangliosides on the cell surface, and it provides a channel for the A or the active components to get into the cell. Now, it doesn't have to get into the cell. It can get into the cell surface, or it can get into the cytoplasm proper. And in this case, it actually gets to the, um, to, um, it's to the cell membrane where this happens. And what happens is, is that the A subunits are enzymes which ADP ribosylates a regulator complex, which is, which is it's all one complex. As I mentioned the other day, there's a, um, there's a receptor, a regulator, an enzymatic component. And in this instance, the regulator complex is, sort of, uh, is where the ADP ribosylation occurs. And part of the complex is an adenylate cyclase. It's not the receptor. It's an enzyme that's part of this complex. So the ADP ribosylation of the regulator complex then activates adenylate cyclase and we get cyclic AMP production. And the cyclic AMP, and I'm not sure what component of the cell surface it is, but the cyclic AMP results, causes other enzymes, presumably involved in water release or ionic, ionic release, it, it causes them to, to, um, to secrete large amounts of water and, and salt, particularly the water being the issue, and you get de massive dehydration, and it really is the dehydration that is the issue here. And so again, I, it is an issue in E. coli and the heat label toxin, but this is not an issue here. You die from this if not treated. And recognising how important it is, in this day and age, you actually, even if you didn't give an antibiotic, you could probably save the lives of most of the people that have got cholera by treating the dehydration, even if you didn't have, in the third world, didn't have the money to buy the antibiotics. Okay? So the dehydration really is the whole big deal in this disease, and that's why this is, this is emphasised. Okay? Now, it's not always the case. There are certain diseases where exotoxins are important in a disease. Uh, sometimes there may just be one issue with a whole bunch of other things that are involved. But in this case... And it mentioned, Dr. I mentioned diphtheria is another example, but where the exotoxins are really the hallmark of the disease. Now, there are plenty of bacterial infections where toxins have got nothing to do with it. Exotoxins, I should say, have got nothing to do with it, and they're totally irrelevant. But this isn't one of them. Okay? So this is cholera. And again, one gets a massive secretion of ions and water into the gut lumen, dehydration and death result, and the primary therapy is fluid replacement. Now, it doesn't mean you wouldn't treat with an antibiotic, you certainly would. Any time you've got a disease that's life-threatening, you're going to treat with it. But the fluid replacement in the, short, in the short term is what saves the person's life. The antibiotic then obviously er eradicates the infection. And again, uh, which is the case, they're not, um, we, you know, in this day and age it's surprising, we don't have a lot of good vaccines against a lot of different bacterial infections. Because in places like the United States, the primary treatment is, anti is an antibiotic. And, if, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper to give somebody an antibiotic than it is to vaccinate 200 million people. Okay? You think of the problems that occurred with the, with the military, where they're only trying to vaccinate 2 million people a few years ago against anthrax, and they revolted, and basically the vaccination was stopped. stopped. You get an idea how difficult it is to tr get 200 million people to want to be treated. The case of diphtheria, for example, we'll discuss later. It's extremely effective, and without the vaccination, you know, bad things happen. So we'll discuss that later. But it isn't case, it's just a case of whether the vaccine is even available. It's a case of, you know, it's a case of money, and it's a case of effectiveness. And this is considered only partially effective, and it's not generally used except again by international travellers. <coughs> okay, so that's cholera. Now, this particular organism, Vibrio parahemolyticus, is singled out. It's a much less 
nasty disease than cholera. And it's certainly more common in this country than, uh, than, than cholera. It's not common, but it's more common. And, and even in Japan it's more common. This particular organism seems to do really well in the presence of salt. Fibrios in general are quite happy in salt, but this organism just loves it. So it's more common in seafood. And so when you see, so that's why this organism is singled out. It's not common in the US, but you do see it. And it's just another, if it's on a differential diagnosis, maybe a lot of times you wouldn't actually, might not necessarily work out what the organism causing a particular disease is in this, in this group of organisms. But, if you, but it's certainly, if you are trying to work it out, it's one of the organisms you consider among your differential diagnosis. Okay, um, now the Campylobacter and the Helicobacter are considered together. They're quite different diseases mediated by Campylobacter and Helicobacter. Originally, the Helicobacter were actually included with the Campylobacter as a, as, a, as, a, as a single genus. Nowadays, I think things have been rearranged. And all I want to say is that the Campylobacter and Helicobacter are genetically related. And that won't be a big shock because I've put a couple of extra slides in. I'm going to show you for the Campylobacter and the Helicobacter what they look like. Because although it's not a 100% thing, I mean, if you see, you know, something that's a gram-negative uh, rod or you see something that's a gram-positive coccus, it doesn't mean necessarily that, that the two organisms look alike, that they're genetically related. But in many cases, they are. And it certainly gives you a good clue uh, that they're related. So, again, I'm stressing this to make sure you recognize these are separate from the Vibrios and they're separate from the Enterobacteriaceae. And you can consider these two together. They're gram negative rods, which are considered to be curved or spiral. And again, they're genetically related. Let me show you what I mean by this with these pictures. Okay. This is the one I've been using for quite a while now. And this is a term that you do need to know pleomorphic. And pleomorphic simply means that an organism isn't, or it, that all the organisms in a field don't necessarily look the same. And if you look here, you'll see that these, for example, there's no way on God's green earth that you can say that looks like, for example, that. Okay, they can be spirals, they can be curved, they can be uh, comma shaped. There's a comma shaped looking one there. You can't confuse that with Vibrio, the way it looks. You could confuse it with Vibrio, excuse me, but you couldn't confuse this particular slide with uh, the, of a Campylobacter with the other slide I showed you of a Vibrio. Okay, so Campylobacter are these pleomorphic curved and spiral shaped organisms. And this is a, uh, one from Dennis Kunkel's site, which I think was interesting because it really shows the curved shape thing very nicely. But there are differences among different strains. And if you notice, all of the ones in this field are spiral shaped. Whereas if you look at that, somewhere came from somewhere else, they sure don't look like that next slide. So I think the issue is we want to see the spiral shaped, they can, be, they can be curved, and they're usually mixtures thereof. And the term is pleomorphic. Okay? As opposed to the vibrios, which are comma shaped. Okay, transmission. Well, you've heard the story before. We hear it again. Infects the intestinal tract of animals. It's, not a zoo, it's a zoonotic infection. Chickens, cattle and sheep can all be infected. It's transmitted in the milk and meat products. This organism, unlike the Vibrio that I just showed you, generally does uh, invade into the epithelial layer but does not go beyond. Now what, what's different here is this feature. And this is the reason Campylobacter wasn't recognized for a long time. And I mentioned this term microaerophilic earlier on in a basic lecture, and I said to you, you'll hear it again sometime. Well, here it is. This organism doesn't do very well if, it's, if there are large, regular concentrations of oxygen floating around, or if it's, if it's floating around in, in regular air. It is, an, it, is an, it is an aerobic organism, but it doesn't survive if there's a high concentration of oxygen. That's what the word microaerophilic means. In addition, this organism doesn't, do doesn't grow best at 37 degrees centigrade. It grows best at 42 degrees centigrade. Now, what that means is, is that if you grow this organism the same way that you grow other bacteria, you'd probably be out of luck. Okay? So it's, it's important in the clinical lab knowing this, and people, you know, people do know this in this day and age. So that's why we're singling out the issue of microaerophilia and the growth temperature, because it's particularly characteristic of what you have to do to isolate this particular organism. And the symptoms are very 
similar to what we talked about in bacterial infections in, in general, the malaise, the fever, but particularly something involved with the gastrointestinal tract, we're going to typically see a diarrhea, sometimes a dysentery, abdominal pain, a lot of times they're self-limiting. Oh, and I should, in this case, there's a small minority, you get a bacteremia, and that's why it says antibiotics occasionally. And that's like the situation we talked about with Salmonella cholerae suis. Okay? But most of the, the vast bulk of the time, it's not. Okay, I just, this one I just grabbed this morning, uh, this morning actually, because I, uh, I, mean, I was going to use it for next year's class, but I thought, well, what the hell, why not use it this, this year's class, because it makes the point very well. This is a picture of Helicobacter, and as I said again, they were very, they can be, they're genetically very similar to the Campylobacter. And you'll notice that these weird shapes, some of them are spiral shaped, some of them, you'll see that looks like a cross section through one of them, but these weird and wonderful shapes. And that's an example of, that's what pleomorphia, pleomorphism is all about. Okay? And so these organisms are, um, and this, what's different here is that um, these organisms, I mean, when my, my dad had chronic um, ulcers for many years, and I remember very well when he was young being periodically called into, pulled into the hospital, sometimes like jerked into the hospital because he was basically dying from ulcers. And the vast bulk of ulcers nowadays are known to be recalled by Helicobacter pylori and are very treatable. And that's a major change that's occurred over the last 10, 15 years. The fact that these organisms are unusual in that they will live in the stomach. Most organisms are killed in the stomach. That's why we talk a lot about the intestine and not about the stomach, because the stomach is very highly acidic, as you all know. And basically, most bacteria don't do very well in acidic conditions. Well, this, is, this organism's got a reason that it does better, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But this is unusual. It lives in the stomach. Yes, it can get into the duodenum, and it does cause ulcers there. But it's particularly thought of as a disease of the stomach, and yes, it's related to the Campylobacter, and you can see that, you can guess that from this, you know, these weird and wonderful pleomorphic spirals and uh, commas and what have you. This organism produces a urease, and it's important that it doesn't neutralise, it doesn't make the whole stomach alkaline. Where the organisms are growing, in the local vicinity, it neutralises that, that urease breaks down, uh, produces um, alkaline as a byproduct for decomposing uh, urea and it neutralizes the stomach acid locally. And that's why these organisms can grow in the stomach as opposed to uh, the vast bulk of other organisms that do not. And the urease is really a big deal in this disease because not only is it part of the pathogenesis of the disease, it's also a feature of, of, what, of, of the diagnosis because in this instance, if you culture the organism, which is not the easiest thing to do, it will, if it produces this urea, if it uses urease, it will produce ammonia, making things very alkaline. You can also detect, by endoscopy, you can detect ammonia. You can detect radioactive carbon dioxide after feeding radioactive urea. So that all the tests are based on detecting products, ammonia or carbon dioxide, from the breakdown of urea by this organism. And it's very treatable. And it really, knowing this has really totally changed the treatment of um, ulcers in this, in this country and the rest of the world for that matter. And I'm not saying all, case, all ulcers are caused by this organism, but, a, but mu the vast bulk of them are. Okay, so in summary, um, regarding what we've had today, sanitary measures protect the water supply. That's pretty clear. Food, water, food and waterborne epidemics are rare in the US because of the sanitary measures that we take and they're still common in the third world. We know that the zoonotic infections come from contaminated animal products or the meat itself or it could be the milk or the water and it's much less well controlled, much less well controlled because you can't, it's, we don't have controls in this country still, um, microbiological controls in the agricultural industry that we do in many other, in the, for example, in the um, pharmaceuticals and, and packaged food industry. So we still see these diseases in the US, not so much the, 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 uh, the, the plagues like uh, cholera and, and typhoid and black death and what have you, but we do see these ones that are coming from these human carriers. But we do, but they have been easy to deal with in terms of sanitary measures, but we still see them coming, uh, the, the ones coming from animals. The therapy in general is if you have a severe diarrhea, 
Um, Story replacement is often essential. And antibiotic therapy, as I say, is very much depends upon the, the um, practice of you know, what works and what doesn't work, basically. And I talk particularly about salmonellosis versus shigellosis. Um, but anyway, if you, but if, you ever get an if you ever get an organism that's got into the bloodstream, there's no debate, okay? And you know that the person's in that situation because they, they're going to be really much, much, much sicker if, they've got, if, the organism, if the organism's got into the bloodstream and is disseminated, and it's, it's just limited to, a, to the intestine, with the possible exception, with, well, certainly with the exception of something like cholera. Okay, so that's the summary of where we are, and that's the, enter, that's the Enterobacteriaceae related ones. So just make sure you know which ones are the Enterobacteriaceae, that you know which ones aren't the Enterobacteriaceae, but recognising we, we discussed everything together because we were focusing on diarrheas and gastrointestinal disease and things related to that, and we threw some other things in because we were covering those organisms at the same time. Okay? All right, thank you. If you've got any questions, I'll be... If you're still not totally exhausted after I've got through the quiz and this lecture as well, I'll be happy to answer your questions.